Breaking news, the U.S. wins the World Cup. Sort of. Welcome to SI Now. I'm Robin Lundberg here with Amy Campbell. You're close, Robin. The joint bid of the U.S., Mexico, and Canada has won the hosting rights for the 2026 World Cup, beating Morocco by a vote of 134 to 65. The United bid's pitch included an expected profit of $11 billion for FIFA, which would be a new record. So clearly, this is huge for U.S. soccer, especially after failing to qualify for this World Cup. But let's look ahead to 2026. Where will soccer rank amongst the U.S. sports then? I think soccer by 2026 will definitely at least be a top three sport in this country. It already, according to recent polling data, has overtaken baseball amongst the, the younger demographic, and it's right on his heels in the, the overall sampling there. Meanwhile, when you're looking at youth participation, it outpaces both football and baseball. And how about this? Eventually, I won't say by 2026, though I think it'll happen faster than people realize, soccer and basketball will be the two most popular sports in this country as they are across the globe. Soccer and basketball. I agree that the that the popularity of soccer is increasing. I do think it will be a top three sport, but I don't think the NFL is going anywhere. And people love to point at the declining NFL ratings. First of all, ratings across television are declining, but the NFL had 37 of the 50 most watch programs last year so the ratings are down a little bit but the NFL ratings are down as a whole it's out of context to say the NFL is declining. Though NBA ratings uh, were, were up overall and, and baseball ratings have done well recently depending on who's been in there and with the NFL no one's arguing that it isn't the, the biggest sport but the reason the ratings declined in the NFL was a story is because it seemed so unprecedented because it had been so mammoth. And, and I think the negative talk around the NFL has accelerated to a degree I didn't expect in the last couple of years. And I just think that sport has an expiration date the more we learn uh, about how brutal it is for the human body. Meanwhile, you, you see that the youth numbers in soccer, not to mention the Hispanic demographic growing in the United States, which will only help its popularity. And of course, the, but the NFL in pop, or football in popularity is still crushing the other sports, even though it's declining a little bit, soccer's increasing a little bit, it's crushing all the other sports. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens over time. And I think uh, potentially a lot of the declining viewership could be attributed to the Trump White House House and a lot of viewers having eyes on those stories instead of the other NFL news. I think history is going to tell us what's going to happen. Of course, there's always a myriad a of, of, of factors, right? Yes. But I, I do think with the pace of basketball and, and soccer and their accessibility, eventually they, they will be the, it's the top be a close two. Race. Of course, uh, 2026 is still a ways away. So we decided to take a crack at trying to predict what the sports landscape will look like when the World Cup comes to town. Here it goes. The starting five for the Los Angeles Lakers will consist of LeBron James, his son Bronny James, Lonzo, Leangelo, and LaMelo Ball. Oh, gosh, look at that. That's like triple B, <laughs> big ball and brand billions right there. All right, what about this? Also in 2026, TB12 method finds a way to fuse Gronk with the horse Gronkowski to create the world's first centaur, Horsekowski. Somehow I believe <laughs> Gronk would be on board with this experiment. Meanwhile, yeah. Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor will sign on for their 10th anniversary rematch. They'll probably both need the oh, money by then. God help us. I can barely handle the first round of that. I, I don't know if I could, if I'd like to see it again. All right, this one's a little sad. The Vegas Golden Knights are going to lose their ninth straight Stanley Cup. No longer feel good. Yeah, it won't be heartwarming at yeah. that point. Finally, baseball will still be looking for ways to improve pace of play. <laughs> They've kind of been moving slowly on that. Yeah, not much has changed. It'll still be, what is the average time? Two hours and 52 minutes. So we're looking at, what, 2.45 by then? Not much better. <laughs> Back to the current time period. Spain is one of the favorites to win the World Cup. But if they're going to do it, it will have to be without their coach, as Hulan Lepetegui was fired as coach of the national team one day after agreeing to take over Real Madrid. Spanish Football Association President Luis Rubiales explained the decision, saying, to win is very important, to have the best coach very important, but above everything is acting in the right way. Maybe this is tough now, but in the end, it will make us stronger. The Federation cannot be left outside the negotiation of one of its employees and find out just five minutes before a public announcement. If anybody wants to talk to one of our employees, they have to speak to us too. That is basic, as this is the team of all all Spaniards. The national team is the most important team we have, and the World Cup is the biggest competition of all. Do you agree with Spain's move to can its coach on the eve of the World Cup? I mean, wow, this is a drastic move with this timing. 
I don't think this was necessary. Players are playing for other clubs. I don't think it's fair to say all of your attention has to be on the World Cup. And like we've seen, this doesn't last forever. Guys have to have work in between these World Cups. And to pass up an opportunity, a really good opportunity for a gig like that, I don't think it's fair to say, all right, you have to be all in with us and miss out on what could be a really big opportunity for you and perhaps even continue to give you a good experience and good exposure as the coach of this team. Yeah, logically, I could see him being able to go on and coach Real Madrid when this World Cup is over while devoting his full attention. But emotionally, mm. perhaps they're just angry about this, right, in the moment. And you, you saw in the statement, this is supposed to be it. Yeah. This is the World Cup for Spain, one of the teams that could be winning the whole thing. To be thinking about another job when you're in the midst of this one, the most important one you should have, that's at least the perspective I get right. from the Spanish side. I understand the perspective. I just think that that's an emotional response, and it seems a little bit extreme to me. To another sport, former NFL star Greg Hardy is now officially a UFC fighter. He was given a contract by the company after scoring a first-round knockout in his pro MMA, de MMA debut, taking out opponent Austin Lane in just 57 seconds. Considering his past off-field history, including a domestic violence conviction, which was later expunged from his record, are you okay with him being in the octagon? Uh, no. Obviously, I have a major problem with this. I think Sports in general have a domestic violence problem. The NFL has a domestic violence problem. I think he got too many chances in the NFL in the first place, and now to see UFC take a chance on him, I think it's completely unfair, especially with something like fighting. It really made my stomach turn to watch him knock this guy out. After having seen the pictures of his ex-girlfriend, it just felt so inappropriate to me. Yeah, I, I totally understand that visceral reaction, yeah. especially because he's committing acts of violence in the octagon. So I could see people saying, how could you possibly allow this to happen? On the other side, I, I suppose I can also see the argument about someone being able to have a, another chance yeah. with their life. And this is within the realm of what he does for a living. But ultimately, I think the main takeaway is the UFC can't claim really anymore to be about anything else other than the bottom line. Right. If you're bringing Greg Hardy in, if you're going to allow maybe Conor McGregor to come back in, if you're going to have a Brock Lesnar, John Jones fight, considering, you know, their suspensions, just admit, you know, you're, you want to put on the best fight that get the most eyeballs, regardless of any of the other surrounding details or factors. To the NBA, Kyrie Irving is eligible for a contract extension this summer, but he's not ready to commit to the Celtics, at least verbally. While promoting his upcoming Uncle Drew movie, Irving was asked about his future, and he said he'll be waiting until summer 2019 to work it out with the team. He said, my hope is that maybe we could limit it to maybe one question a day about what I'm doing next year. So, Robin, why do you think Kyrie wouldn't at least verbally commit to the Celtics? What could he possibly want? I don't know what's up with this dude. I don't know what Kyrie Irving wants. Honestly, he was on a team with LeBron James competing for a championship while getting to take more shots than LeBron. Okay, he wants to be the star somewhere else. He's lucky he wound up in Boston because it wasn't like he was a free agent. He didn't get to choose where he got to go. He happened to get traded to an up-and-coming team with a great coach, a great history, where he's the star player. At least he could say, my plan is to stay in Boston. In the meantime, he's going to invite more and more questions and have someone like me wondering, what will it take to possibly satisfy Kyrie Irving? I agree. I think the only thing in the back of my mind is this LeBron James cloud that's hovering while we're hearing more news about him to Boston. Maybe he wants to be flexible to not have to play with LeBron again. We will have to wait and see. Another guy up for a contract extension is Draymond Green. He's up for it this year. He says he'll turn it down in hopes of a super max deal. Do you think he's worth it? I think in a vacuum, there's a question about whether he's worth it, and that always comes up with Draymond Green. For this team, of course Draymond Green is worth it. Look, they, they're not the team they are without him. Yeah. He allows them to play small but still feel big. You know, the, the defense he provides, he's a playmaker as a secondary cog in the middle of the floor. I think the real question will be, will he be worth that super max in a year? Yeah. You know, does he start to decline a little bit? And are, are you overpaying him for past work? Plus, there's the, the looming specter of Anthony Davis. Davis because we know the Warriors are interested in him and if it came down to a choice somehow then I think they, they might be choosing Davis over Green despite everything Green has brought to that team kind of as their heart and soul. The looming specter of Anthony Davis. I agree. I think they're not the same team without him on a team of superstars. He does bring that emotional juice that they don't they don't rise to this occasion without them on a team of stars.
We now welcome in our golf analyst, Ryan Aselta, live from the U.S. Open. Ryan, I often hear the courses for some of these major events talked about in treacherous terms, but particularly this one. How tough a test will Shinnecock be for everyone? Well, Robin, a lot depends on the weather, and that's usually the case with the U.S. Open. But the USGA and the U.S. Open needs to get it right this time. They've had a couple of uh, disasters on their hands the last few years. A couple years ago out at uh, Chambers Bay outside of Seattle. Uh, then you had weather issues at Oakmont. And then last year at Aaron Hills in Wisconsin, where the wind just didn't blow and the scores were 16 under par, which is not U.S. Open like. So Shinnecock Kills here, we're talking about a course that's over 100 years old. They haven't been here since 2004. But this is a tough golf course if the wind blows the way they expect it to. And if that happens, I don't expect to see a lot of scores under par. Back in 04, there were only two players that finished under par. It comes down to the wind. And the rough, you're going to see a couple different cuts of rough. The first cut of rough, Robin, is treacherous. And then after that, you've got the fescue, which can come up to your knees. I was here a few weeks ago playing. I found myself standing knee high in some rough. So I think it's going to prove to be quite the test, even though this is a course that dates back over 100 years and it's not quite as long as some of the newer courses these guys are used to seeing. Okay, I asked a question before I got to Tiger Woods. That feels like an accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> can Tiger win this tournament? Of course, Tiger can win this tournament. Uh, T Tiger's been uh, an enigma the last few weeks. He's shown a little bit of everything, flashes of everything, just not at the same time. He's had weeks where he was putting lights out, led the field in putting. Then he had weeks where, on a Saturday, we never saw such ball striking from Tiger Woods in the last 10 years. That's how good it was. But he hasn't been able to put together the complete package for four rounds. Can he do it this week? I'm not I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't seen it yet from Tiger and the U.S. Open to try to figure that out and uh, try to put everything, every aspect of your game together when every aspect of your game is being tested. I don't know if this is the week to do it. Tiger hasn't had great success here. He uh, finished top 20 the last time here. He missed the cut many, many years ago, the first time he played at Shinnecock. But his boat is docked here in the Hamptons, so he's living comfortably, relaxing, coming into this tournament. I do expect him to be a factor. I expect one day this week he will shoot up the leaderboard. Whether he can then translate that into a Sunday finish, well, that remains to be seen. Yeah, he's reached a believe-it-when-I-see-it when I territory for me. How would you handicap the chances Phil Mickelson completes the, the career Grand Slam? Yeah, that's the other big storyline. It's, it's Tiger, can he win, he, who hasn't won a major in 10 years. And then there's Phil Mickelson looking for that elusive Grand Slam. Robin, he has six second-place finishes in the U.S. Open, which is mind-boggling to think of how close he's been over the years. The difference between Tiger and Phil is Phil's playing pretty good golf. He's won this year. He won the WGC Mexico a couple months ago, and he's playing pretty good golf coming into here. He's had a different approach this week. He's not really practicing on the grounds here at Shinnecock. He's been playing over at Friars Head, which is another course in the Hamptons, uh, played over there with Ricky Fowler and Tom Brady yesterday. So, uh, casual approach to it, but he is focused. He's trying to stay away from the questions, the spotlight of can Phil win the Grand Slam. If he does, it'll be the greatest story in golf, I'd say, in the last 25 years, especially in New York, where four of his second-place finishes, Robin, have come at New York golf courses, and we know this New York crowd loves Phil Mickelson. I think he has a much better chance of winning this week than Tiger does. Tiger and Phil still the most famous names, but who would you say are or is the overall favorite to win? Well, Dustin Johnson comes in red hot. He's back to being number one. He lost that number one ranking a few weeks ago to Justin Thomas. And then DJ goes and wins last week, and he retakes the number one player in the world. And, and by far, he's one of just a couple golfers. When he's on his game, there's a gap between him and the rest of the PGA Tour. We saw that last week. He won by six strokes down there in Memphis. He is longer than anyone on tour. This is going to be a long golf course. They back it up quite a bit with some new tees and he's straighter than anyone so it comes down to Dustin Johnson putting the golf ball if he gets hot with the putter I think he can win this golf tournament uh, hands on no problem keep an eye also on Justin Rose who's been playing great golf this season he's a former U.S. Open winner so two guys to keep an eye on uh, two former U.S. Open winners knows the patience that it takes to win at U.S. Open and then when to get aggressive and make that charge. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate your time this morning. I can tell you're already enjoying yourself out there. Always, Robin. Love it out here. Thanks.
As NFL training camp gets underway, we're joined by Albert Breer of the MMQB. And Albert, we'll start with Andrew Luck. He was throwing the football in public for the first time in a very long while. What's your confidence level in Luck this season? Well, Amy, I, I think what we saw on Tuesday was probably a little bit of a dog and pony show. I was probably more encouraged by what he said after practice than just the fact that he, you know, threw a couple balls into the flat during practice. And the encouraging part here for me is hearing that the soreness isn't the same as it was last year. Um, and then he's starting to feel normal throwing the ball again. That's important. Doesn't mean that he's there yet um, because clearly he hasn't gone through the sort of throwing regimen that he'll need to go through um, to get ready for the season, to condition himself to throw the ball in a game. Um, he hasn't been hit yet. There are still a lot of hurdles he's got to clear here. But I think what he said after practice, more so than the fact that he threw a few, few balls at practice, has to be really encouraging. The fact that the Colts are comfortable putting him out there in front of the media to throw, that part of it's encouraging. Um, and as far as my confidence goes, I I'd say, you know, you have to be cautiously optimistic here. This is a guy who had a lot of setbacks last year, um, at least four over the course of the 2017 calendar year. They said he was going to be ready for camp. He wasn't ready for camp. They said he was going to be ready for week one. He wasn't ready for week one. Um, they didn't put him on the pup list, which meant that they felt like he'd be ready before week six. He wasn't ready before week six. And then, of course, they shut him down for the season. That's four setbacks that we know about. There may have been more than that. Um, you know, clearly this timetable has been delayed and delayed and delayed. So there's a reason to have healthy skepticism here. But what he said after practice was encouraging. And the fact that the Colts were comfortable putting him out there to throw the ball in front of everybody was encouraging as well. Colts not the only team with some quarterback questions. The Ravens are calling Lamar Jackson their young Michael Vick. <laughs> Do you think Joe Flacco should be worried? I think this one's pretty cut and dry, Amy. Um, you know, if the, if the Ravens are a contender in 2018, Lamar Jackson isn't going to play quarterback for them. I mean, that's I, I think the, the, that's where they're at right now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's similar to almost every other rookie quarterback. The only reason that you ever see teams go through the full redshirt season for um, their first round pick quarterback is if they're in contention all the way through. In fact, there are only two examples of it over the last 10 years. Jake Locker got a true redshirt in 2011 in Tennessee. The reason was the Titans were nine and seven. No reason to bench Matt Hasselbeck then. And then there was last year, Patrick Mahomes gets a true red shirt in Kansas City in 2017. The reason why, of course, was the Chiefs won the AFC West. So there was no reason to move away from Alex Smith. So I think Lamar Jackson will play quarterback in 2018 at some point if the Ravens fall out of contention. If the Ravens are contending through the season all the way into December, then we will not see Lamar Jackson play quarterback. If um, Joe Flacco is healthy and the Ravens are contending. He'll be the quarterback in 2018. So, you know, like that, that's really what it is. And that's what it has been. And I think that's what it will be, um, you know, in the fall and in the way into the, in, and into the uh, stretch run of the season. Well, the Browns also have some new quarterbacks there and some weapons for those guys to throw to Josh Gordon claims they have the best receiving core in the NFL. Is he right? <laughs> <laughs> I think potentially they could be. I mean, I like if you trust that Josh Gordon's going to be what he was in 2013, um, you know, look, I think him and Jarvis Landry complement each other well. Obviously, Corey Coleman was a first round pick. Uh, and so the, 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 the high end potential really is there. Um, but it's been five years since Josh Gordon was that player. Can he be that player again? I know they've been impressed with what they saw the the the, the you know, sh short little periods where they have seen him over the last five years. He still showed that ability. Um, so, I, you know, they've got potential to be the best in the NFL. Are they the best in the NFL right now? I think the Rams have a chance to be awfully good with with uh, Brandon Cooks and Cooper Cup and, and Robert Woods. The Texans with DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller, and maybe they get a little bit more out of Braxton Miller this year. To me, the best right now is probably the Atlanta Falcons. They've got a true number one in Julio Jones. They've got Muhammad Sanu opposite him. And then Calvin Ridley, who's got a lot of potential um, coming in there as a first-round pick. And so I think the Browns have the potential to get there, but to call them the best right now I think presumes a lot of things. The, the, the biggest thing of all being that Josh Gordon's going to be the player that he was five years ago and that Josh Gordon's going to walk the straight and narrow. As we've seen over the last few years, those two, those two things, um, it really can't be a given that that's what we're going to get. Always great stuff from Albert Breer of the MMQB. Albert, thanks for the time. 
All right. Thanks, Amy. We're about a week out from the NBA draft, and to go over SI's latest mock draft, I'm joined by the front office's Jeremy Wu. Let's start with the biggest riser. Who's moving up the boards? One guy who I think has really played his way up the draft uh, in the last you know, few weeks especially is Jerome Robinson from Boston College, who sort of flew under the radar during the season despite being the top scoring guard in the ACC. You know, Boston College you know, sort of had an up-and-down year. Uh, but teams really like Robinson's ability to score. You know, he can score at all three levels. He can score off the dribble. He can play both guard spots. You know, he's 6'4". Uh, so I think, you know, that coupled with his intangibles, you know, teams like him as a person. He's been doing well in the interview circuit. I think, you know, he sort of put himself into that 16 to 20 range. Uh, and before, he was probably considered more of a late first rounder. Uh, so he's really helped himself. Been on a consistent rise, uh, an unheralded guy, but as you mentioned, that those combo guard qualities. Now, the opposite of that, who's the, the biggest faller right now? So on our most recent mock draft, I have Miles Bridges from Michigan State falling to 15 to Washington. I think there's a scenario where Bridges uh, is the guy who sort of slips out of that top group. You know, someone has to, you just mathematically, has, has to fall out of that lottery group. Um, and I think it's, you know, there's a scenario where the other wings go first. Uh, if the Clippers don't take him, you know, he, I could see him slipping sort of down to the middle, not necessarily at a fault of his own, but just sort of as the machinations of the lottery, you know, work themselves out. You know, someone has to sort of be that guy. You know, he has those 3 and D skills that, that fit in kind of anywhere. Was he hurt by staying in school? I don't know if he was hurt, I, but I do think you, when you do stay in school and you're already sort of a first-rounder, first you know, you're going to get picked apart. You know, anytime someone goes to scout you, you're the first name on the list. Um, you know, so for guys like that, there tends to be some type of, sometimes a blowback. You know, it, it's yet to be seen whether it'll hurt him, you know, in the actual draft order. Uh, but it's possible he's the guy, you know, teams are worried about him being a tweener. Uh, and he gets maybe a little undervalued. How about the, the biggest wild card heading into the draft? Yeah, so it's, it's still unclear with Michael Porter Jr. in terms of, you know, where he lands. Uh, the word is that his back has improved. I, I think he's probably, you know, trending towards being ready to go next season. Uh, he's holding another pro day this week. You know, teams in the top 10 are looking at him. I don't think he's going to fall out of the top 10. Uh, but there's a lot of different scenarios for him. You know, the Kings are said to have interest in him as high as number two. I don't think they would do it at two. Maybe they'd try to move down. Uh, you know, the Bulls at seven are a potential destination for him. But I don't think he'll get too much further than that. Uh, but sort of how this week plays out and which teams you know, decide they're serious about him, I think will sort of play a big role in how the rest of the lottery falls. A tremendous upside pick, right? Because he was a guy talked about as number one before the injury. Exactly. I think there's a lot of value there. Uh, you know, if you get him and he's, you're able to keep him healthy uh, and sort of build a team around him as a scorer, you know, I think he can really help. Uh, so there's risk, obviously, with the health factor. Uh, and teams are, there's some concern about the background on him, you know, what type, type of teammate is he. Uh, but I think the talent is unquestionably there for him. What about a uh, question mark? You said unquestionable <laughs> talent with, with him. Who is the biggest question mark? Yeah, Robert Williams from Texas A&M. He's another guy, uh, you know, we talked about Bridges. Williams is another guy who might be, fall out of that lottery group, uh, you know, depending on, you know, which teams like him. You know, I could see him going to the Clippers at 12 and 13, but I think if they pass on him, I don't know if Denver will do it at 14. I don't know if Washington will do it at 15. And Phoenix is 16, and, and they're probably going to take Ayton, number one, DeAndre Ayton. So... It's possible Williams falls into those late teens range uh, if that happens for him. And I think, you know, he's sort of been a guy who teams wanted to see more of. He skipped the combine. You know, I don't know if people were happy about that, you know, want to sort of get to know him a little bit more. Uh, I know he's making the rounds now, but we'll see if it ends up affecting his draft position. Stop me if you've heard this before. LeVar Ball said something absurd. Here he is on Undisputed guaranteeing all three of his sons will play together in the NBA. If the Lakers pass on LiAngelo, are you starting to think about Lonzo's got to go elsewhere eventually? Eventually, he's going to go elsewhere. He's going to go to the best. Whoever going to take all three of my boys? I don't care. Milwaukee, Toronto, whoever. But LeVar, they got, hold on. I understand that you want what's best for your boys, but what about what's best for them? What if they don't want to all play together? Are you drunk? He said, are you drunk? <laughs> LeVar continued by also guaranteeing that LeBron would be playing in L.A. for the Lakers. At this point, do you take anything this guy says seriously? I take what LeVar Ball says with a lick of salt, right? <laughs> uh, more than a grain. I have to take <laughs> some of it seriously. He did call Lonzo to the Lakers. Yes. He was vindicated by the facts in his feud with the president. Remember that? <laughs> but I don't take anything seriously in the situations he has no control of, and he really shouldn't be talking about the Lakers. And, and by the way, if LeBron 
wants to go to the Lakers and doesn't want LeVar Ball around, I think he could make that happen as well by getting Lonzo shipped out yeah, of Yeah, I think LeBron has a lot of power over the future of the entire Ball family, so they should probably keep the King happy, especially if they want them all to be playing together. <laughs> another day, uh, another quote from LeVar Ball. He's back, everybody. We'll be back, back same time, same place tomorrow. In the meantime, check out at SI Now Live on Twitter for the latest videos and updates. I guarantee it.